Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. And I can hear the brush of angels' wings. And I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Lord, I love that little chorus because it is, uh, I love the little chorus by itself, but I love the message that it has too, that it, it reminds us that you are here with us. Um, several weeks ago, we, we looked at a scripture that, that says, wherever two or more are gathered in your name, that you are there in the midst of us. And we, we understood the context of that at the time, but the bigger picture of it is, is simply that when, when we are together as the body of Christ, there is something that, that is beautiful and powerful and mystical that occurs. And um, it is a reminder that we need one another as the body of Christ. It is a reminder that, that you desire us as family to be together. And that you as the head of the household have called us together. Especially on, on Sunday mornings, but even into our small groups. Um, there, is, there is beauty, there is strength. There is joy to be found even in the midst of brokenness when we, as the church, are together. And I thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be here with us today. We claim the promise that is found in Isaiah, um, chapter 55, verse 11. This is truly, when it is your words that go out, they shall not come back empty. And it's my prayer this morning that the word that I would speak would be your word. And that we would be inspired by it that we would be transformed by it, that we would grow as disciples because of it. And that as we um, live into those truths that we will discover today, that the world will be a better place because of what you're going to do in us and through us. So let your spirit move, Lord. I ask that the anointing of your Holy Spirit would fall upon us. Um, it's not an accident that this particular group of people have gathered today at this time. You have called us to be here. And um, each, the message that you have for us as a family um, has a purpose that is beautiful and powerful. So may our hearts be open to receive. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, while we were, Lisa and I were on vacation, some of you know we were on vacation last week. And uh, I did something while we were, I was on vacation that I haven't done for a very long time. Anybody want to take a guess what it was? Nothing! Good job! I did nothing! <laughs> See, usually, and it's, it's very difficult for me to do nothing. I just don't do nothing very well. And it drives Lisa nuts, I will confess that to you. Usually when I'm on vacation, I need, I need some kind of projects or several projects to do. And that keeps me um, sane and generally her sane as well. But I agreed with her this time when we went on vacation that the, the goal would be to do nothing. We would get up when we wanted to get up. I was usually, when I wanted to get up was usually about 6 or 6.30. Again, I was driving her nuts by that. Uh, we would lay around the pool and when we were hungry, we would go out and we'd get something to eat. And for the most part, we fulfilled the plan. But by the end of the week, because of that, I was going stir crazy. And the only thing that kind of saved me was the fact that I brought um, three books along to read while we were on vacation and suddenly I was just realizing that was probably my project, right? Um, anyway, there was, there was one book that I was reading um, that was written by a pastor, a guy named Erwin McManus. Anybody ever heard of Erwin McManus? He is the pastor of a church in California called Mosaic. If you've never read any of his books, just go on Amazon or someplace like that and just put in his name, Erwin McManus, and a lot of his books will come up. He's an awesome author. Um, the book that I read specifically of his this, uh, when I was on vacation was called The Last Arrow. And the reason why I wanted to share that with you today is because um, it was while reading that book that Pastor McManus quoted a scripture that I had no memory of ever having read before. Now I'll confess to you, I don't know much of anything, but one of the things I do know is I know the Bible. So when someone quotes a passage of scripture, that I don't recall ever reading before, I pay attention to that. Because I'm thinking, how could I have missed it, right? So, I, I listened 
to his story revolving around this scripture and then I went to it myself and as I was reading that passage of scripture all of a sudden it hit me. I know why I was supposed to pay attention. I know why I was supposed to read that book. I was supposed to read it and read that story for all of you. If you've been with us the few weeks before we left on vacation, I had been, I shared two, a two-part story or a lesson on destiny. You remember that? And one of the things that we learned about destiny is um, whether you believe in it or not, God does. And it's our, our privilege and our responsibility, it's our choice really, to decide whether we will join God in living out the destiny that he has planned for us or not. You don't have to, in other words. It's your responsibility and your privilege to make that decision for yourself. And this, this destiny discussion has been kind of under the larger umbrella of this Profiling God series we've been doing. And the purpose of that is to help us understand God better, the nature of God. Because sometimes for us as human beings, it's difficult for us to understand how the God of the universe would want to have relationship with us. But he does. The God of the universe wants to have a relationship with you. But what that looks like, until we understand better who God is, it's always going to be kind of a mystery. So that's what the purpose of that series is. To um, help us understand God better so that we can understand the relationship that we can have with him better. And destiny is a part of it. Well, unbeknownst to me, before vacation, was that there was a third part of this teaching on destiny that you all were supposed to know. And that's where the scripture comes in. Uh, it's the scripture that I want to share with you today. Paige shared a bit of it with you, but um, there's a bigger story that goes along with it. So if you would, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to take them out and turn to the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament book of Kings. I don't know when the last time you read the Old Testament book of Kings. It's been a long time for me too. Uh, chapter 7. Turn to chapter 7. And as you're turning there, and by the way, uh, Leanne wanted me to let y'all know that if you don't have your own Bibles, we got some of the coolest new Bibles that we want to give away. Um, and if you don't have a Bible, we want to make sure that you get one. Uh, if you're... Um, 50 and above like me and you need a large print Bible, hang on, we're getting some, we have some of those on order. But these new ones, for anybody that has glasses or can uh, see a little small print, they're good for you too, so. Second Kings, yes. And Linda will tab it for you so you can know exactly where Second Kings is, right? Okay, good. So here's the context for our passage of scripture for today. Um, it's a story about the nation of Israel. And they find themselves in a bad place because the kingdom is under siege by this army of Syrians. And they have been under siege. Basically, they are in the city, in the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And the, the army has been camped outside of their city now for a long time. And supplies are running low and hope is even more scarce. All right, so you get in the picture. But God sends the Israelites a prophet named Elisha to let them know that even though it may feel like, like the Syrians are in control, they are not in control. God wanted them to know, so Elisha was to tell them, God wanted them to know that he was still in control. And that all of this had a purpose. Even them being under siege by the, by the Syrian army was, was part of God's purpose, was part of his plan. And he said, in just a few days, I'm going to show you exactly how I am in control. And there will be no doubt in anybody's mind that it's me. That I'm the one in control. Not them, and certainly not you. I am in control. You just got to trust me. All right, I love that part. It's hard to trust though sometimes, right? Well, this is where the heroes of the story come in. In... Um, 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 3, we are introduced to four lepers. And they are an unlikely group of heroes, I suspect. And they find themselves between a rock and a hard place. Because they have this uh, incurable, contagious disease, they have to live outside the city walls. Right? 
And, but what would happen in, in normal times, they would bring them food and water and everything that they needed. But when you're under siege by an army, you can't open up the gates, right? So here's these lepers outside of the city and they're thinking, we're in big trouble. We're, we have, basically they had two choices. They could just sit there and do nothing and they would either starve to death or be crushed when the invasion actually inevitably took place, which didn't sound like a good choice. Or they could surrender to the Syrians, which meant they would probably be killed, which just didn't sound like a good choice. Or they would be uh, imprisoned, which didn't sound like a great choice, except maybe they would still be alive. They were caught between a rock and a hard place, right? They really didn't have a choice, did they? Imprisonment, the possibility of imprisonment was better than certain death. So they made the decision, the four of them made the decision that they were going to gather up their courage and they were going to go and surrender to the Syrians. I want to stop right there for a second. When you've looked at your life, have you ever felt like your destiny was unfair? Like the circumstances of your life just didn't seem right? You look at everybody else's life and they seem a lot better than yours. How is it that I got dealt the hand of cards that I did? It's just not fair. Well, imagine how those lepers felt. They had no good choices. The best choice was to be imprisoned. But it was at that particular moment that their destiny took a sharp right turn. It was at that moment when they made the decision, the best decision they could under the circumstances, they made this, the decision to surrender. And that was the moment that God intervened. Because as they walked up to the Syrian encampment, God began to whisper in the Syrians' ears. He says, you better watch out. There's an invading army coming. Four lepers, right? You're in big trouble. And as God was whispering in their ears, they started to shake. And then they started to get fearful and they thought, what are we going to do? So, you know what they did? In the face of this great invading army, they tucked tail and they ran. They left everything behind. This whole army just left their, their food and their wine and their weaponry and their treasures. They just took tail and they ran away. Because they believed that they were about to be invaded by this horrible, massive, scary army. So, the poor lepers, they get to the encampment and there's nobody there. And they're thinking, what? They see all this food and this wine and these, these weapons and all these treasures. And guess what they decide to do? Anybody read this story lately? Guess what they decided to do? Anybody? Party! Is it? Oh, I thought maybe it was up on the screen. How did you know that? That was a good job. <laughs> That's what Ben would do. <laughs> He'd say, I'd have a party. <laughs> they decided that they were going to eat and drink and just have a grand old time. And that's what they did all night long. The Bible says they just partied all night. Until at one point, and this is in verse 9. If you've got your Bibles, you'll see this in verse 9. One of them said, you know what? This isn't right. In 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 9, he says, What we are doing is not right. This is good news. What we are experiencing is good news. And we're keeping it to ourselves. We're not sharing it. We, you know what we need to do? We need to, we need to go to the king and tell him this good news. In that one verse, those four lepers put their finger on one of the most important aspects of destiny that I almost forgot. Listen to me. What they were trying to say is this. Our destinies are never meant to be our own. Do you understand that? 
None of the plan that God has for you is exclusively about you. Oh, it's, it's, it is about you. But it's about what God would love to do through you if only you would allow him. There will be times in your life when it feels like the destiny, just like these, these four lepers, right? There are going to be times in your life when it feels like the destiny that you guys have been dealt isn't fair. And you can set back and you can give yourself to an inevitable fate that you think just isn't fair and, and you'll, you can complain about it and, and you can just give in and give up. Or you can choose to give it to God. Even the unfair things, even the unfair part of what your destiny is, you can choose to give it to God. To see what God might do through it. And when you choose to give this, what appears to be an unfair share, when you choose to give that to God, God just might do something beautiful with it. And then there's going to be times and other times in your life when it feels like your destiny has taken that sharp right turn. And you're going to find yourself in the midst of blessings. And that's when it's really going to feel like it's all about you. That you somehow deserve this. And, and you're going to just kind of party. Right? But you need to remember the lesson of the lepers. You need to remember that even in the blessed times, it's not all about you. And that that is meant to be shared too. And it's in the midst of sharing your destiny that you ultimately will be blessed. Now here's what you need to know. Big picture wise. Here at Prairie Bible Church we believe the scripture teaches that we really, as Christians, we only have three, three responsibilities. To worship Jesus. To grow as his disciples, to grow into his image, and to serve Jesus by serving the world. Ultimately, that is your destiny. That is all of our destiny. But the unique thing is, is that each and every one of us have a, a particular destiny that God has planned for us too. Sometimes it's going to feel unfair, and sometimes it's going to feel like a blessing. But all of it ultimately belongs to him. And when we choose... To give our destinies to him. He will do something beautiful through you. If only you'll allow him. This morning. Um, we're having communion together. And I don't know where you happen to be. In what point in your destiny you happen to be today. Maybe today you find yourself at a point in your destiny where you're feeling like, this isn't fair. I hate this. If that's where you find yourself today, when you come forward, what God is inviting you to do is to give that to Him and see what He might do through you. Do with it through you. Maybe you find yourself today at a point in your destiny when you feel like, it's all good. I'm partying. Remember then, it's still not all about you meant to be shared. And as good as it may feel when you're in the midst of the party, it feels even better when you share it with others. It was 2,000 years ago and uh, Jerusalem was in the midst of a party. The nation of Israel every year would try to um, throw this party. It was called the Passover and it was, it lasted for about a week and there was different elements to it and all the elements had a purpose, a destiny I guess you could say. Each one was to remind them of something that God had done or each element was to remind them of something that God was doing or the something that God would do in the future. And people literally would come from all over the world because by this time in history the Jews had scattered. And they weren't all just living right there in, in Jerusalem. They were all about the land. But they would come back, many as could, would come back to the city and there they would remember together. Well, Jesus on this particular Passover 
Jesus and his disciples were there. And because Jesus was their teacher or their rabbi, he was the one that was going to lead them through a particular piece of the Passover celebration, which was known as the Seder meal. Right? And we've talked about this many times in the past if you've been around. The Seder meal is just what I describe it as. It is a meal and it's got different courses to the meal. And every piece of the meal or course of the meal has a purpose of, rem of reminding of what um, God is doing and what God will do. In fact, I think I've shared with you before, this cup is called an Elijah cup. And they, every, uh, at their Passover or their Seder meal celebration, they would always have an empty chair and a cup for Elijah. Because the, the scripture teaches us that Elijah would return and tell of the, the coming of the Christ, the Messiah. So they always set a table, at the table, an empty place with a, with a cup, believing that maybe this was the, the Seder meal in which Elijah would show up. Everyone knew how to do it. They knew the Seder meal like the back of their hand. They had been doing it ever since they were little children. So when Jesus broke from the tradition which was their Seder meal, when he said something that was different than what they knew was the next thing, they paid attention. Because Jesus took the bread that was there as part of the Seder. He lifted it to God. He blessed it. That part didn't surprise them. But he lifted it to God, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And he turned to his disciples and he said, Now, take and eat, for this is my body. They had no idea. Did, did he say what he just said? What I thought he said? This is his body? This is my body broken for you? I don't know what you think when you come to communion. If it's just something that we do once a month and just a religious exercise. And it's really just bread. According to Jesus, this isn't just bread. Every time you eat of the bread, you are to remember that this is his body. Call it a representation. You call it whatever you want. But this is not just bread. And every time you eat from it, remember that you are the body of Christ. Every time you eat from the bread, you are to remember that your destiny doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. And the blessing and, the, and the, the experiences of your life, what you perceive as good and bad, those belong to Jesus and they are meant to be shared as the body of Christ. That's your responsibility. To share hope with people who are experiencing destinies right now that don't feel very hopeful. Because you have hope. Because you have Jesus. And you are his body. Remember. Well... After he said that, um, everything went back to normal and they, they had that stuck around in the back of their head were thinking about what he was saying, but he, it, they went back to the traditions, what everybody was expecting until after the meal, gee, there was another cup there. And Jesus took that cup, he lifted it to God, he blessed it, and then he turned to his friends and he said, now take and drink, for this is the cup of a new covenant. My blood shed for the forgiveness of, of sins. What did he say? What is he talking about? This cup is his blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. What he was trying to say to them is, things are about to change, folks. The paradigm is shifting. What you perceive as an unfair um, destiny, you have no idea. I'm about to experience what is truly an unfair destiny. Dying on the cross. Being whipped nearly to death. My blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. And he said, every time you drink from this cup, you're supposed to remember that his blood was shed for you, that you'll be forgiven. 
You see, the frightening thing about all of this is when we actually, if we actually embrace this destiny that we have been given to be the body of Christ to the world, you're, you should be thinking, man, that, I can't do that. I am such a mess. I am so broken. I am so sinful. He can't use me. Well, what he's saying is, yes, he can. Because when he looks at you, he doesn't see your brokenness. He doesn't see your mess. What he sees is the beauty of who God created you to be because of the shed blood of the lamb. You have been forgiven. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your brokenness. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus in you. And that's good news. It should be. By the way, if you came to church today and you were feeling bad about yourself, stop it. Because you're awesome. Because of Jesus. Right? Amen. Remember. I'm going to invite um, Kevin and Deb forward, Van Orney and my wife Lisa. We're going to be the communion stewards today. And as they're coming forward, I'm going to share with you a little bit about how we do um, communion here at Prairie Bible Church. Um, I do believe that God is powerfully in the midst of this. And to, to somehow cheapen it into some religious thing that we just do once a month is, you're the one that's being hurt by that. Don't think of it that way. This is powerful. This is, this is Jesus in the midst of us. Remember that. Experience it in its fullness. And, and if you give yourself to that, what he will do in you and through you in these moments could literally change your destiny. But he's not going to make you. But he will offer it to you. What we will, what, the way we do it is we, we will invite you in just a moment. I'll say the, the altar is open and you're invited. No one will dismiss you. You don't have to wait. But when you're ready, you come by the center aisle and we'll give you a piece of bread and a, and a little cup of juice and we'll say, this is, listen to me, this is the body and the blood of Christ given for you. And then you can eat the bread and drink the juice and pray here as long as you'd like. And then when you're ready, if, take, put your cups in the baskets here on the front and return to your seats by the side aisles. I don't... I don't know what he might do through you, do in you because of this communion today, but he wants to do something beautiful in you. He wants to remind you of something beautiful, and something powerful and, and palpable. But you've got to want it and ask for it. And while you're wanting it and asking for it, why don't you give him your destinies while you're up here? And then watch what he does with those two friends. Jesus is inviting you. The altar is open.
story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long 